Good evening, everybody. I would like to call this meeting to order. As we are all aware, Queen Elizabeth II passed away on September the 8th, and her funeral took place today. Flags at all Durham District School Board schools and buildings have been at half-mast in honour of the Queen and will be until sunset tomorrow, Tuesday, September the 20th. Please join me in offering our condolences to the Queen's family. Thank you. The Durham District School Board acknowledges that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships, both historic and modern, with the territories upon which our school board and our schools are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that the Durham region forms a part of the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, the Mississauga peoples, and the treaty territory of the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation. It is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we teach, we learn, and we live. It is my pleasure to introduce the choir from G.L. Roberts Collegiate Vocational Institute and their teacher, Rachel Burney. The students will be performing O Canada tonight, and we welcome them. Thank you for helping us. Thank you to the students of G.L. Roberts and their leader, Rachel Burney. That was wonderful. You have an agenda in front of you. Are there any declarations of interest? Seeing none, I would like to suggest an amendment to tonight's agenda to add trustee matter, which would be the first item following the approval of the amended agenda. Is there any objected objection to the amended agenda? Seeing no objections, this agenda is adopted. Moving on to that trustee matter. I am in receipt of an email from trustee Paul Crawford resigning from the Board of Trustees effective today, September the 19th, 2022, due to unforeseen personal reasons. The Education Act provides that a member of the board may resign with the consent of a majority of members present. I am looking for a trustee to move a motion to accept the resignation of Trustee Crawford. Is there a trustee who can move this motion? And the motion would read that the Board of Trustees accept the resignation of Trustee Paul Crawford 
effective today, September the 19th, 2022. I'm looking for somebody to put forward that motion. Thank you, Trustee Templeton, seconded by. Thank you, Trustee Bird. All those in favor? That motion has passed. Thank you. Trustee Lundquist, you have a comment? I just would like to observe that when um, Trustees Barrett and Brainy exited last week, we indicated we would invite them to the, I don't, I don't know what you would call it, the see you later party. I don't like, that's not what it's called, but the, you know, a moment to thank them for their service. And I would just ask that we consider inviting P Trustee Crawford as well. Um, he has served the board and for a long period of time too, and I just don't want there to be exclusion of anyone. Thank you. We have several sets of minutes in front of us. We have two that I'm looking for a motion to receive. Those are the approved minutes of May the 16th and June the 6th. Then I'm looking for a motion to approve the draft minutes of June 20, June 27th, July 25th, and September the 6th. Could I have one motion to receive and approve those six sets of minutes? Thank you. And that's Trustee Thatcher, seconded by Trustee Templeton. All those in favor? Thank you. Moving on to community presentations. We have no community presentations this evening. Then ministry memorandum, and we will go to Director Marsh. Thank you through you, Chair Morton. And this is uh, just a very brief information update for all trustees to build on the information update from two weeks ago. Uh, we continue, school staffs continue to work on creating a sense of belonging for every child in the Durham District School Board by getting to know who their students are and where their students are in their learning journey so that they can offer appropriate programming and assist students in their academic achievement as well as their mental health and well-being. However, the most pressing issue which we flagged for you uh, two weeks ago is that um, we are heavily oversubscribed in terms of enrollment. We are uh, trying to uh, work through approximately 1,400 additional students, mostly at the elementary level. So we are continuing to restructure classes as um, required to ensure that classes are at appropriate sizes. That restructuring will continue until the end of the month, and on October 3rd, we will bring a finalized report to you in terms of uh, enrollment numbers and staffing allocation. Uh, while we understand that it's not necessarily ideal for families and children as we work our way through, nor for staff in terms of um, working through the adjustments in classes, it is something that is part of the regular September startup. However, it is this year somewhat more extensive given our enrollment has grown so significantly. I also want to flag that busing continues to be a concern we know, uh, especially in the north in terms of the route uh, DSTS assures us that they are continuing to work through those challenges as best as possible. On a positive note, unlike many districts across the province, we um, have not had many cancelled bus routes. Uh, you know that some busing has been taken away for the year at the last minute in some districts uh, because there were not enough bus drivers. We are not in that situation within Durham uh, because of the work that was done last year in terms of bell times, but we do know that there's still a lot of concerns and we are in staff or in regular communication, as I know some trustees are as well with DSTS to solve those issues to the best of the capacity that they can at this time. That concludes the update. Thank you. Thank you, Director Marsh, for addressing those many bus concerns that we have encountered in the last two weeks. And over to you, Trustee Thatcher.
Thank you, and through you, Chair. Uh, Director Marsh, I just have a question uh, around the, um, the supply bus drivers. You mentioned last day that we were in the process of hiring bus drivers for uh, supply purposes. I'm just wondering if you had an update on that. I'll ask Associate Director uh, David Wright if he's heard from DSTS what the progress is on that one. Thank you very much. Through you, Madam Chair, um, we currently have enough drivers to service all routes. However, some of the routes are being serviced by supply drivers. So uh, some individuals aren't interested in having a, a permanent position and they would, they would rather be a fill-in or, or a supply uh, person. So I know that our operator partners are continuing to recruit and hire um, but I, we don't have a glut of supply drivers. We have um, just enough to service all of our routes uh, currently. My understanding is we've had two um, route cancellations since the start of the year, uh, a few delays, um, not necessarily tied to personnel, more with, with routing and, and construction and traffic, et cetera. Um, so I, I think that we're doing fairly well, although uh, need to continue to actively uh, recruit to ensure that we're able to enjoy this same level of service throughout the school year. Are there other questions or concerns? Seeing none, we will move on to the public question period. I would like to invite Dylan to ask the first question. Dylan, we look forward to hearing from you. Hello, everyone. Hello, Alan, Dylan. Alan. Welcome. Hi, Carolyn. I hope that you've recovered from COVID. Yeah, I'm, be I'm better now. All right, on to my question for tonight. My question tonight is about the 9.30 to 3.30 p.m. bell time. Earlier this year, between the date of January 17th and April 19th of 2022, DSPS and the DESB conducted a bell time review and consultation process uh, since the start of the 2022-2023 school year. On September 7, 2022, we realized with the 9.30 bell, a.m. bell time, it has addressed the concerns about the part-time jobs, but it hasn't really addressed the other concerns that were raised at the start of the 2022, or I'm actually saying this, last school year, and it's also approaching the very late start and end times of the 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. school day, which was in place back in the 2021-2022 school year. And that's my question I have for now. Thank you, Dylan. I think we will go to Associate Director Wright for a, a response. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Thanks, Dylan, for the question. Uh, in the bell time review last year, we included the parameter uh, that all secondary bell times needed to be between 8 a.m. and 9.30 a.m. based on the feedback we received from stakeholders about the later 10 a.m. start. Because of our attempt to minimize changes at elementary schools and uh, due to the tiered structure of our busing, secondary schools tended to fall, outside, uh, fall to the outside of the parameters with most of them starting at uh, either 8 or 9.30. So not all secondary schools are starting at 9.30 this year. Uh, most are either starting at or around 8.30 or at or, or around 9.30. Uh, admittedly, neither, uh, neither end of that end, uh, spectrum is a perfect solution. Uh, we did hear both positive and negative feedback related to both early and late start times. That being said, the real driver of the bell time review was to align the number of buses uh, we had on the road with the number of drivers that bus operator partners were able to hire. And though we know uh, that bell time changes can be difficult for families and for schedules, uh, we have seen the benefit of the process that we went through last year with the very limited number of rope cancellations that we've seen so far this year. So as uh, Director Marsh uh, mentioned just a few minutes ago, the bus driver shortage continues to be a very big issue across the province. Uh, we will continue to work locally here to recruit and retain drivers. As well, we will work with partners like Durham Region Transit. Um, that being said, DDSB and DS DSTS have uh, positioned themselves just about as well as they could given the circumstances to serve those students who are eligible for transportation. 
I do have a supplemental question as well. One supplementary, Dylan. Well, when, since when the initial bill time review is done, done, both bill times I said were the early, are the early were the earliest bill times we've seen since September 2020. And but I realized that what was part of this bill time used to be 810 to 210 at one point. I'm wondering, comparing to the bell time change that we had in 2017, was it only a 10 minute change from the pre-pandemic time? Dylan, I apologize. I don't have the, the board report in front of me uh, that highlights the 2017 bell times. Uh, when we brought the final rebel, bell time review to trustees for approval, um, the spread was included there. So uh, happy to follow up with you uh, via email, Dylan, to confirm the, uh, the actual switch. Yeah, and I, I do want to address that. Oh, I got a lot of people uh, worry back at the beginning of the month of September. I caught COVID at, at the start of this month. Thank you, Dylan. And thank you, Associate Director Wright. We will now move to our second question and I'd like to invite Akua to ask her question. Akua? Akua, could you ask your question? Good evening, my name is Akua from Pong. I'm a resident of Whippy. My question is regarding the French Immersion Program. So the DDSB provides an enriching French Immersion, immersion Program to 18 elementary and secondary schools across the board, allowing students to learn one of our official languages with the goal of fluency for everyday life. The Diplôme d'études en langue française, also known as the DELF, the Diploma in French Language Studies, supports this goal and provides grade 12 students with the opportunity to take an internationally recognized French proficiency exam before graduating, which they can then transfer onto post-secondary studies and beyond. Parents across the board were surprised to find out in May of last year, shortly before the exam was to be administered by the DDSB, in partnership with the DELF, that they were no longer doing so, leaving students to find alternative arrangements to take the exam after graduation based on the available times to write the exam throughout the year. Families advised that there was little to no reason behind the last minute decision. Um, to the board, will the, DDSB be, will the DDSB be administering the DELF exam this year? And if not, why? Thank you for your question. And we will go to Superintendent Margaret Lazarus for a response. Uh, thank you for your question. I'm happy to tell you we will be administering the DELF this year and we'll be doing it two times. So uh, we're very excited about that. We've already begun the planning uh, for the fall. Uh, our dates that we have right now is between November the 21st and December the 2nd. Uh, right now we are contacting all the grade 12s that are taking French in French immersion and in core French to get their email addresses and we're going to start blasting and getting them ready so they can get prepared for the DELF uh, this fall, so twice this year. Thank you. Chair, I may just add in terms of um, last year, I do want to say that Superintendent Lazarus and team worked extremely diligently trying to figure out any way possible to make the DELF uh, operational. And it was due to the number of educators from regular classrooms we would have had to have supervised the DELF would have meant we would have had to close schools because we wouldn't have had enough teachers to supervise uh, students in the regular day program. And the reason for the communication was that we continued to work looking to try to hire occasional teachers and looking to try to make it happen. So it was with every effort um, and reluctantly that we had to, in the end, uh, say it wasn't feasible in the interest of offering uh, regular school to all of our students and not closing elementary schools as a result of the number of staff involved. And I will also say Superintendent Lazarus uh, advocated 
allocated um, because the timing of the DELF we have no control over. We had staff willing to work evenings and weekends to make it happen, but of course it had to be administered between certain hours in the day and uh, the government of France was not flexible on those hours. So it was with uh, heavy hearts and reluctance that it was cancelled. Thank you. Thank you for your question and thank you for the two responses. I would like now to invite Melissa to ask her question. Melissa, are you there? Melissa, could you ask your question, please? Hi. Um, this year, the population of Ormiston has increased significantly past um, future projections and continues to receive um, students. Um, as they are holding school. Um, the population is now at 705 students and the utilization rate of the school is now 149%. And I'm just wondering when Ormiston will be closed as a holding school. Thank you, Melissa. I think we'll go to Associate Director Wright for a response. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks for the question, Melissa. Uh, this has been a year of significant growth. I think we are welcoming uh, well in excess of 1,000 new students to DDSB uh, in excess of what we uh, projected or the growth that we projected. Uh, so we are seeing uh, pressure, enrollment pressure uh, at a number of schools. Um, there are approximately eight other schools in the area that are being used um, uh, as holding schools in addition to Ormiston. And so the whole West Whitby uh, community uh, is feeling a little bit of pressure. Um, we um, see Ormiston continuing to be a holding school for the foreseeable future. Uh, however, our planning department is reviewing holding capacity this fall based on the numbers um, that have arrived at all of our schools and we'll bring a report to board in January to highlight any holding school changes in line with the timing for kindergarten. So when I say it will continue to be a holding school uh, until we have the ability to build in West uh, Whitby to relieve some of that capacity, Ormiston will need to continue to, uh, to hold those uh, students. Uh, we realize that it's getting close to its capacity. And so over this fall, we'll be reviewing that uh, as well as what other facilities might, able to, might be able to take some of that pressure. And just uh, as well, Chair, if I may add, uh, this is something that both staff and concerns have uh, both staff and trustees have been concerned about for uh, a few years now and annually we have been requesting from the government of Ontario to fund uh, a school in West Whitby and to date we don't uh, we have not received any funding for that geographic area we will continue to advocate for funding to build a school in West Whitby Did you have a secondary question, Melissa? I do. So, so my question is, what is the maximum capacity of the school? Like, at what point is it like it cannot accept any more students? Because the ministry is like 130% utilization, and my understanding is 12 external buildings. Well, we're really close to that. So the capacity is an interesting. Um, it's an interesting thing uh, because it's um, uh, it's a little. Um, subjective. So the ministry uh, considers 23 to be the loading for class sizes. The average funded class size for kindergarten students is 26. The average funded class size for grades 1 to 3 is 21. And the average funded class size for grades 4 to 8 is 24 and a half. So um, we don't expect to have 23 students in every classroom. Uh, our, our funding to maintain schools uh, comes at 100% at when we're at 100% utilization of the school. And so we like to see all of our schools at or just above 100%. Uh, when you add portables, it doesn't take away from the on-the-ground capacity or add to the ability to, to um, uh, increase the capacity. And so when you add portables, you're going in excess of 100% utilization of a site. The real limiting factor for us is, um, uh, is building code and facilities. And so uh, we have to have a number of washrooms for the number of students, etc., cetera, um, um, and pressure on the site. So we do listen to the school communities about traffic pressure, about student safety. Um, and so uh, that's part of the review that we'll be doing this, uh, this fall as we see um, how all those factors have played out. 
Thank you, Melissa, for your question. Thank you for your responses. I would like to now invite Catherine to ask her question. Catherine, are you there? And there is Catherine. Hello. Go ahead and ask your question, Catherine. Thank you, and thank you for um, having me here tonight. Um, as Melissa, uh, I was trying to listen in as well as being um, in the, the waiting room. Um, Ormiston is at uh, you know almost 150% capacity. I did hear some of your response to that. Um, so my question is therefore, um, you know, you're speaking about classroom sizes. We're concerned with the overall school size, and um, you know, with our our school being at probably at this point, I think over 150% capacity. Does the board uh, follow the ministry guidelines where when it comes to the um, going over the 130 percent as well as the 12 um, external buildings as well as the number of bathrooms we have you know two bathrooms for 150 percent capacity and it's my understanding that there is um, at least one other school of, in, in the area that is being flagged as under enrollment under enrollment and uh, continued projection of under enrollment Thank you, Catherine. We will again go to Associate Director Wright. Thanks. Thanks for the question and for bringing the concern forward. Uh, certainly, we're aware that uh, the school is feeling the pressure. As I highlighted in the uh, previous uh, report, the concept of capacity from a ministry perspective doesn't necessarily align with our rea realities uh, of how we're funded uh, on the ground. Um, this fall, we will be reviewing through our planning department um, how enrollment has come to our schools and uh, where we might be able to uh, hold additional st uh, students until we do receive funding to uh, build a school in West Whitby and take some of that uh, pressure away on a more permanent basis. There are a number of reasons why a school may not be used as a holding school, and so uh, the utilization number doesn't always necessarily tell the whole story. Uh, schools may be dealing with their own growth in their own area and, and not be able to uh, accommodate um, growth coming from uh, without of their boundary. Schools may be dealing with the lack of uh, washrooms, parking space to accommodate portables, uh, lack of available transportation, etc. So uh, there are uh, a number of other schools holding in uh, that West B Whippy area, um, and we are uh, hoping that in the next capital priority submission we'll be uh, receiving uh, the funds to to again put a permanent solution in place. Thanks. Thank you, um, Catherine. Did you have a supplemental? I do. Thank you. Um, so I, I understand that you are looking at what can be done in the future, where students can go, holding schools. What can you do for Ormiston students right now? Because it is not a safe situation over there. And um, you know, I, I would I would imagine that the board is also looking at liability issues. So what what can you do right now instead of doing a report in the fall, for example? Associate Director Wright, I understand that Associate Director Markovsky is familiar in terms with of the safety protocol, so I'm not sure if you wanted to turn it over to him or if you wanted to respond first. So thank you. And in relation to specific safety protocols, and Director Marsh, I don't know if perhaps we can read the next question because it perhaps directly intersects with um, the, the subsequent question that just came forward. Um, from Catherine, the school principal is working with the superintendent. If there are any kind of capacity concerns in terms of the natural flow, oh, you know, you mentioned sort of washrooms and sort of other key considerations. Uh, there can be a follow-up discussion in relation to that. Catherine, it's really hard when we talk about safety, unless there's specific concerns that are addressed forward, we would obviously put a team together and respond. I can talk a bit about um, evacuation plans and emergency response plans which speak to more general safety in terms of procedures that the school would undertake. So in relation to that, uh, annually the school will review um, 
as part of their consultation with their school staff. The school administration will work through their emergency response plans and evacuation plans. plans. If there is a rise in enrollment, as we're seeing in Ormiston, the school will adjust and reevaluate those plans accordingly to ensure that there can be a safe and orderly exit of staff and students in the case of a need of an emergency or an evacuation. So in the case with 700 students, provided that every classroom within the school understands how it is that they would be exiting the school, those are some of those considerations that take place during a review process. Uh, similarly, I know there was concerns raised in relation to kindergarten classrooms being on the second floor. Uh, my understanding when we connected with the principal is that they actually have a dedicated emergency response plan for their kindergarten classrooms where support personnel, their special education resource teacher, educational assistants are also involved in ensuring that safety requirements and safety procedures are being met uh, in terms of a response plan. And if there is something specific, I know you mentioned re in relation to washrooms, that's something that we could follow up. Uh, if any further information is shared, we could work with the school to ensure that all safety measures are being met. And I don't know if there's anything further specific that you'd like to comment on. Uh, that's more of a general yeah. overview. So, sorry, I, 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 I get this, the safety piece. Um, I was also, my main question is, what can be done for Ormiston now instead of looking into these reports and processes and, and taking months? Um, this, the students need the board's help now. Thank you. I, I'm going to uh, say a few things. One is there is reference in terms of the school capacity, and I think we should clarify that when the, uh, school capacity is created by the Ministry of Education. It's actually connected to a funding formula in terms of repair costs and custodial staff. So it's not something that we, uh, there's a maximum number in terms of their school capacity guidelines. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that part of it so that we're all sort of working from the same page. Uh, I understand that in a number of our schools and in previous years as well, there have been some classrooms, for example, where we have to repurpose spaces. And uh, Superintendent Lazarus, I don't know if you have more information in relation to that, but there's no doubt that there's an impact on students in a school when we don't have enough classroom space for them in terms of repurposing space. Uh, and so what we've done, for example, in other sites where library uh, has been converted into two or three classrooms, we create a portable library that uh, travels to students students in their classrooms, and I don't want to, by any stretch of the imagination, say these are ideal circumstances, but staff do the very best that they can given where they're at. Uh, we don't anticipate more students registering at Ormiston. Uh, I think we've had the bulk of the new registrations um, in terms of this year, so we're not anticipating that uh, there is going to be a significant increase between now and June. I believe we're also considering looking at at the um, possibility of a new portable. Uh, we uh, There is a challenge in terms of portables in uh, Ontario right now and availability. So we have actually contacted our coterminous board to see if they have surplus portables. And we're also looking at uh, what might be made available with some creative problem solving at other sites. So I know staff are working on that, but nothing definitive at this stage. Um, and I think Superintendent Laz may have more to add in terms of the superintendent for the school in terms of planning. Just to add that um, the library has been repurposed as a classroom, but it's just temporary as they're waiting for the portable to arrive. So once the portable arrives, that situation will be resolved. Thank you, Catherine. Moving Thank you. on. I would like to now invite Adrian to ask his question. Adrian, are you there? Hi, uh, yes, I am. Good evening. Uh, my question is, is in regards to Ormiston enrollment. Uh, have any of the uh, DDSB trustees or superintendents visited Ormiston Public School this year to see the negative impacts that the growing enrollment is having on staff and students? Um, currently, there's no library for students as the library is being used as a classroom. Uh, until more portables arrive and students students are also receiving less physical uh, education classes than they used to in previous years. 
Thank you for that question. I would again go to Associate Director Wright. My apologies, Director Chair. Martin. I think Superintendent Lazarus says the school superintendent will respond. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that question and through you, Chair Morton. I have been to visit the school to assess the situation and I'm in close contact with the principal just to make sure that things are going well. And what I can tell you is that the students are learning, the students are happy, and they are doing very well. With regards to the physical education class, we know that the intermediate students are scheduled to have uh, phys ed every single day of the week. Uh, our junior classes have it four days a week and our primary three days a week. But in consultation with the phys ed department, all teachers are engaging in daily physical activity apart from the, the daily gym classes or the three days a week, but there is daily physical activity for all the kids as well as their gym period. Did you have a supplemental question? Oh, yeah, I just have a quick follow-up question. Um, so in terms, uh, you said that you've, uh, you've already been there. Uh, is there uh, more plans to visit the school on an ongoing basis just to like do kind of a check-in on, you know, staff, students, mental health about, you know, the, 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 the growing issue with the enrollment? Absolutely, I will be visiting the school regularly and talking to students, and I am scheduled to go there next week as well. So we'll keep uh, the situation monitored, and uh, should any, any situations arise that we have to address, we will address it immediately. All right, thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Superintendent Lazarus. I would like now to invite Michael to ask his question. Michael, are you there? And Michael, could you ask your question, please? Yeah, hi, uh, welcome back to a new school year. Does the board acknowledge that three DDSB library book titles were reported to the trustees last November and characterized by various trustees, including the chair, using words like alarming, shocking, and disturbing due to their age inappropriate pictorial and written representations of sex acts that I have been asked to censor because even though these are approved school library books being read by kids, I have been advised by Mr. Serjanik uh, uh, that the chair will not allow the contents to be disclosed in a public board meeting. So given that these books are so sexually graphic as to require censorship in this meeting, why then are they acceptable for our kids? Thank you for your question. As previously indicated to you, the board followed its procedures with parents, trustees, students, and staff on a review committee that carefully considered the books. Thank you for your question, Michael. Okay, I have a follow-up for that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, since these books are too shameful to be discussed in this meeting, do you believe these books are acceptable to the vast majority of the parents and taxpayers of this community? Or do you just not care what we think because you believe your judgment and that of a few select committee members is superior to the collective wisdom of the larger community? And by the way, I would be happy to share this information with any parent who is interested, uh, they could contact me at alfred.mike at gmail.com or uh, I give permission for the school board to disclose any of the communications I've had with them to, uh, to anybody in the public who's interested. Thank you. I'd like to move on. The remainder of the questions will be asked and read out loud. And I would like to ask Executive Lead Serjanik to read out the remaining questions and staff will respond. Thank you, Chair Morton. And through you, we have multiple questions this evening. One of the questions was already addressed by Associate Director Markoski in relation to school emergency procedures. Uh, the first question is from Lisa Binksma. In relation to Ormiston PS, has the DDSB secured land for a new elementary school? 
to be built in the new Country Lane subdivision and has the Ministry of Education approved funding for this project. I'd like to turn it over to uh, Director Marsh to direct the question. Thank you. I believe Associate Director Wright will address this one. Thank you very much. Through you, Madam Chair, uh, there are uh, five elementary schools and one secondary school planned in West Whitby, uh, one uh, to support the Country Lane uh, neighborhood that's indicated in the question. We do not uh, actually um, have any land holdings uh, at this point in time. However, we do have agreements with developers to purchase land uh, as we receive capital priorities funding uh, from the ministry uh, and are able to start um, building schools to support the growing West Whitby community. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from John Cost. Uh, does the DDSB accept any identity claims from students uh, without the need uh, for evidence? Uh, if students are allowed to identify as a gender that opposes their gender of record, can they likewise be accepted as another racial group such as Indigenous without the need to provide proof of their Indigenous status? Turn it over direct to Director Marsh to respond. Uh, thank you. I, I do believe Human Rights Advisor Mather is going to um, respond to this question. I may add on at the end. Good evening and thank you very much for the questions. The DDSB follows policy guidance, data standards, and other guidelines that are set out by the Ontario Human Rights Commission, the Anti-Racism Directorate, and the Ministry of Education, which supports self-identification, including the right to self-identify gender identity. In addition, under the DDSB's Indigenous Education Policy and the Voluntary Confidential First Nations, Métis and Inuit Students Self-Identification Procedure, students or their parents and guardians have the opportunity to voluntarily and confidentially self-identify as having Indigenous ancestry and that can happen annually through the online registration process and at any time throughout the course of the year by completing the First Nation, Métis and Inuit self-identification form at their home school. Thank you. Thank you. And the final question is from Linda Yardley. Uh, data from uh, school boards uh, documented a book about boys under achievement shows that boys in Ontario schools have a higher rate of suspension, expulsion, dropout, and lower rates of university enrollment. Is this also the case at the DDSB and what are those rates? Uh, I'll just read out the uh, supplementary question associated with it. Uh, and if these rates are statistically unfavorable uh, for boys in the DDSB, uh, what is the reason for the inequity and is it due to systemic discrimination against boys, and what would the DDSB do to rectify this apparent systemic di discrimination? I'll turn over Director Marsh to direct the question. Thank you. I believe Superintendent Hamid is uh, online, and he will respond in relation to our census data. Thank you. Uh, the data in the Durham District School Board is in line uh, with data from other districts that show that one of the identity markers that may be disproportionately represented in negative outcomes are those who identify as male. The data specific to boys can be found in the EQAO summaries of the district, which are in previous board reports and on the EQAO website. With regards to the question, is this due to systemic discrimination against boys? The answer has to be looked at through a broader lens of all aspects of identity. These would include identity markers such as race, creed, gender, identity, et cetera, along with experience markers such as trauma and the compounding effect of classism and poverty. When examining students through an intersectional approach, we do see that systemic structures do place barriers that result in certain identities and, and experience markers being disproportionately represented in negative outcomes. As a system, we are taking this data very seriously, and the board has recently approved an Indigenous education policy and procedure document, along with the human rights anti-discrimination and anti-racism policy and procedure document that identify, identify clearly what responsibilities and accountability staff have towards ensuring learning and working environments that are free from discrimination and discriminatory barriers for all students. These policies then translate into the learning that we are currently engaging in as a system as we deconstruct systemic structures and start to reconstruct them through an anti-oppressive lens, for example, in the way in which curriculum is developed. Thank you, and Chair Morton, back to you. Thank you, Executive Lead Sergenic, and we will now go on to our next item on the agenda, and that is 
Durham District School Board presentations, and we are looking at the summer learning programs from 2022, and apparently there are six superintendents who are going to participate in this presentation, so I'm not sure who is going to take the lead, but please feel free. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, this, the report may be found on pages 39 to 50 and speaks to the extensive work of many departments across the DDSB and the large variety of programming made available this past summer to thousands of DDSB students of all ages. Sincere thanks go to all the DDSB staff who worked over the summer not only for the rich learning opportunities they offered to our students, but also for prioritizing joy and fun for the students involved. Tonight, we will hear from three presenters on some of the programming that was made available. I'd like to welcome early year manager Amanda Gleed, summer school early years principal Tricia Frolick, also currently the principal at Claremont Public School, and Lisa Drake, senior manager and clinical lead, speech, language, and hearing. We'll begin with Amanda and Tricia. Thank you, Superintendent Negro. Um, and through you, Chair, it is my pleasure to join the board this evening alongside our early years summer tutoring team to share our report uh, on the Great Beginning Summer programs that were once again offered to our children and families this past summer. I would like to also welcome Trisha Frolick, who was one of our regional program leads for the summer, and we look forward to sharing all about the Great Beginning Summer tutoring programs that are offered this year. According to research, children arrive in kindergarten as unique individuals shaped by their cultural, personal capabilities, and day-to-day -day experiences. More importantly, children enter kindergarten at different stages of development. The question that then emerges is how do we honor that? The statement selected from the kindergarten program that you see on the screen reminds us that building positive relationships is the key. As the, as the statement suggests, the importance of early experiences for a child's growth and development is recognized in the design of the kindergarten program, which starts with the understanding that all children's learning and development occur in the context of relationships. It is also the result of these positive relationships and early learning experiences that has the power to shape and influence a child's overall health, development, identity, and well-being that will carry them for the rest of their lives. We honor that by fostering and creating learning environments that are caring, safe, inclusive, and accepting. Recognizing the importance of a child's early years and the power that these years have in shaping their lifelong learning and development, the DDSB has continued to implement a number of great beginning summer programs in support of our youngest learners who will be returning to the early learning space for continued learning and development or entering the space for the very first time. Aligning with the goals of our kindergarten program, the purpose of these programs are to build a sense of belonging, to ensure a learning environment where all, all students can thrive, to establish a strong foundation for learning in the early years, to help support a smooth transition from the home, online, childcare, or early learning setting into the kindergarten classroom, to provide opportunities for relationships, play, and inquiry, and to set children on a path for lifelong learning. As we know, a child's engagement and excitement for learning begins in their first experiences, often before they enter the school building. We all have a very unique opportunity to set positive stage for lifelong learning and know that what a student learns in kindergarten will help to prepare them for successful learning experiences in later grades. As detailed within the report, Great Beginnings offered six programs for our DDSB children and families this summer. These programs included K is for Kindergarten, which was directly supported by our partner, the YMCA, as well as our school success programs, which were also implemented by our child care and early learning partners. Our student success program for Black students was offered at Biola Desmond Public School by our very own DDSB educator teams. These programs supported our incoming DDSB students who entered kindergarten for the first time this school year. In addition to our programs supporting the transition into kindergarten and utilizing the funding from the Tutoring Supports Program, 
the Great, Great Beginnings was able to offer three additional programs to support children in kindergarten, children moving from kindergarten to grade one, as well as primary English language learners. We encourage you to review the report for a full breakdown of the specific details of each of the six programs. I will now invite Trisha Frolick to speak to the data we gathered following the implementation of these Great Beginnings offerings. Thank you, Amanda. Well, the intention of the Great Beginnings summer programs was to build a sense of belonging, to establish a strong foundation for learning in the early years, and to help support a smooth transition from the home, online, childcare, or early learning setting into the kindergarten classroom, it was also critical for these programs to support children to feel excited and ready for school. When reviewing the impact of the programs, we should look no further than the quantitative feedback that was received from our phenomenal educators who implemented the programs. As you can see, the educators indicated that prior to the start of a Great Beginnings program, students were rated primarily as somewhat prepared in their school readiness at a total of 65%. However, upon completion of the program, that rating changed to 38% with very prepared jumping to 62%. When analyzing educator satisfaction with the programs, it is clear that there was significant appreciation for the programs with 100% indicating they enjoyed the program and 100% or respondents indicating that they would support another program in the future. From a parent or family perspective, it is again an overwhelming response of 100% of respondents sharing that their child enjoyed the program and 100% confirming that their child is now ready to begin school in September. And lastly, from a developmental perspective, families reported an overwhelming 96% that the program made a difference in their child's overall development and provided some very positive qualitative feedback with their overall experience. Thank you, Trish. Um, extending beyond the quantitative and qualitative data captured within our program surveys, we would like to uh, take some time to share some of the wonderful photos that were captured by our phenomenal educator teams over the course of the summer. Please enjoy the incredible work of our youngest learners at the DDSB. I would now like to uh, to pass it off to Lisa Drake, who will speak to some of our summer summer clinical assessments. Thanks, Amanda and Tricia. To provide sorry to provide continuity of learning through clinical service over the summer months, over seventy five students participated in assessments with psychological services and speech language pathology teams. Assessments focused on learning more about students' language, cognitive processing, and academic achievement. While these assessments rely on standardized measures, both teams are also utilizing dynamic assessment practices where clinicians try out different strategies with students to determine which ones help them to make progress on specific skills. After students return to school this fall, established processes within these teams have ensured that the transfer of this critical information has taken place between clinicians and educators within the classrooms. And I will now turn it over to Superintendent Negro. Thank you. This concludes our presentation and we're happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Questions, comments? Trustee Lowry.
Thank you, and through you. I just wanted to say that I'm um, incredibly impressed with um, everything that happened during the summer, and I would just like to thank everyone who was involved and, and led this. I'm also curious. Um, uh, certainly, our students needed this uh, to prepare themselves for these most unique times. So. I'm very, very impressed. I'm just curious, would this type of programming in the summer be a possibility? A lot of the secondary students are really struggling to get their uh, volunteer hours in. Um, is it possible that um, if this happens again next year that um, secondary students could be involved in this programming and possibly get some of those hours? I'm happy to respond to that, uh, Chair. Who's going to respond to that? I'm happy to respond to that, uh, Chair Morton. So uh, thank you and through you, uh, Chair. Uh, we did, in fact, have students who were in our Focus on Youth program as uh, um, uh, supports for the program uh, that allowed them to achieve uh, some of their hours as well. Uh, and we would uh, continue to offer opportunities, absolutely, uh, Trustee Lowry, for secondary students to be involved in supporting the program, absolutely. Thank you. We'll now go to Trustee Edwards. Thank you. Um, I echo uh, Trustee Lowry's uh, uh, comments around the breadth and the rich learning opportunities that have been provided over the summer. Um, and the, some of the feedback that I've actually heard from parents as well, excellent feedback on those, the programs that were offered. However, it, it always seems like there's just never enough and that there are, you know, there are families that um, would have liked to participate. And I'm just wondering, uh, again, just uh, for people's information on how students were chosen from them and the other thing is to ensure that uh, transportation was provided wherever possible for those programs that might have been out of their home school. Superintendent McCauley. As for um, the grade one to six programming, we had requests from thousands of parents and uh, we worked really diligently uh, until the last day and the first day of the program to accommodate all students in the grade one to six program. I'd call on other superintendents to comment on any limitations they may have had. Is there a specific program, uh, Trustee Edwards, that you heard about? Turn the mic off. Um, it was it was more of the um, the kindergarten and the early the early years pro some of the early years programs about availability not being able to and then it's also just uh, a misunderstanding maybe of transportation availability as well. Um, so it's a communication, I believe, but those were the, the most of the programs that I heard about as far as if there was issues getting into the programs. Superintendent Hamid. Sure, I'm happy to start. And then if uh, Amanda wants to add on, feel free to. I believe that we were able to honor all of the requests that we did receive for transportation. Uh, uh, and um, there were no, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Matt, if you want to add, we were able to also um, accommodate all of the requests for participation in the program um, specific to uh, the schools that were able to run the program. One of the challenges that we did have was, of course, staff had to be available to run the program. Uh, and so wherever staff were available, we were, um, we were absolutely filling the, the spaces wherever we could. Is there something you wanted to add, Amanda? 
No, I, I think you said what I uh, what I would have jumped on as well is that uh, we did base our locations uh, depending on staff availability um, and looking at the schools who did have educators who were uh, were able to run and support the programs um, and making sure that uh, that the programs that could run that they were accommodating for the communities and if there were other communities that had higher enrollment numbers um, offering spaces in programs that didn't have a full enrollment base to those families if they were able to to transfer to that school if that was something that they were interested in. Okay. Thank you. And I have one other question. Um, and um, I guess when it comes to the, um, I, I know the most all this was covered through uh, learning uh, summer learning opportunity grants and so forth. I'm just wondering, does that also include the uh, secondary credits that were obtained or were there fees attached to those? Superintendent Nevels. Thank you for the question. So we don't charge any fees for students to take uh, credit courses within the summer. Um, and all of the funding comes from uh, ministry registers um, for attendance uh, for summer school. I see no further comments or questions, so I say thank you to Amanda, thank you to Tricia and Lisa, and also thank you to our contributing superintendents. Wonderful presentation. Moving on, the report from the Committee of the Whole in Camera, and I would go to Trustee Vice Chair Thatcher. Thank you, and to you, Chair. Had the board approved no, the No, 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 no. Oh. I better turn mine on first, right? <laughs> You're on. Thank you. And, and through you, Chair. Uh, the board approved the actions of the Committee of the Whole in Camera and adopted the motions made at the Committee of the Whole in Camera meeting as follows. The disclosure of intimate, personal, or financial information in respect of a member of the board or committee an employee or prospective employee of the board or a pupil or his or her parent or guardian. Chair Morton, um, this is my report. I move that report. Thank you for moving the receipt of that report, Vice Chair Thatcher. Moving on, this is something we look forward to every meeting. Good news from the system. Director Marsh, share your good news, please. Thank you. I'm very happy to turn it over to the students who are narrating uh, this month's update for trustees. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the DDSB students and staff, we are happy to bring you good news from across the system. Students from schools across the district were excited to get back to school for the first day of 2022, the 2023 school year. Students met their new teachers, reconnected with old friends, and were introduced to new ones while sharing stories from the summer. Elementary and secondary schools on a modified calendar started schools in August, while regular calendar students started their school earlier this year in September. Welcome back, students and staff. Students had a summer full of fun, learning, and adventure at Durham Forest Summer Camp. The eight weeks of camp featured outdoor and experiential learning activities designed to inspire, educate, and reconnect children to the world around them. On August 26th, the graduation coach for black students from Pioneer Secondary School hosted a community barbecue. It was attended by students and families, as well as Pioneer staff, DDSB staff, and several community organization members. It was a day of fun, food, information sharing, and community building. Students from GL Roberts and Sinclair Secondary School also came in to help volunteer at the event. On Friday, August 26, the DDSB had the honor of hosting the Mississauga of Schoolock Island community, as well as the DDSB community to celebrate the unveiling of the newly named Fudasuke Mandament Public School. Fudasuke was an Anishabi elder, a world-renowned water advocate, and a residential school survivor. On August 6, Teacher or Mentor Abroad's TMA, first post-pandemic teacher training team, returned from the Dominican Republic. Its co-leader was Wendy Chan, a teacher with DDSB and member of TMA's program committee. The theme was creating conditions for student-centered learning after the devastating impact of the pandemic on student dropout in the Dominican Republic. McCaskill Mills Public School staff represented the Township of Brock Accessibility Award for their ongoing commitment to making the school facilities and the community a welcoming and inclusive place for all. Way to go. 
It was a busy school year for the students and staff at Seneca Trail Public School. They held two fundraising events to support cancer care and children's mental health at Lake Ridge Health, raising $2,454.70. Every year, the Music Counts Band-Aid program gives up to 15,000 to schools across Canada to help them purchase new or repair old musical instruments and equipment. Mick Shannon, music teacher at Mary Street Community School, advocated strongly for the school and they were lucky enough to receive the full 15,000 to buy new ORF instruments. With gratitude and excitement, the Mary Street team is getting the instruments into the students' hands where they belong to bring the joy of music to life. Over the summer, many schools with the help of staff and community members grew and tended to school vegetable gardens. At Saywell Public School, Chief Custodian Thompson and her garden club created and maintained flower boxes. At Waverly Public School, students worked hard to create a vegetable garden as they welcomed families to enjoy and care for it over the summer. At Coronation Public School, staff from We Grow Food informed everyone about harvesting techniques and summer care. On July 19, 2022, the Ignite Learning Durham Foundation welcomed representatives from the Royal Bank of Canada to the Village Union Make a Difference Depot. They presented a generous donation of 10,000 to help support DDSB students who face financial barriers. Facility services kept busy over the summer with heating and ventilation upgrades, classroom renovations, window replacements, and roofing and masonry projects. Some highlights include the soon to be completed new roof, bell tower, and weather vane on the original Uxbridge Public School building, which will replicate the historic style from 1911. Roof replacements at Anderson CVI and Dr. Robert Thornton. Renovations in the art, science, and music classrooms at Harmony Heights. Washroom renovations and classroom upgrades at Vincent Massey. The entire exterior of Badoske Mandaman Public School is in the process of being recladded. And so much more. The Great Beginning Student Success Program for the Young Black Students was once again offered at Viola Desmond Public School this summer. The program has six educators and 42 students enrolled in three classrooms. Interest in the program was overwhelming with educators offering cultural themes tied into the educational curriculum and school programming. GDSB is thrilled to announce that the Government of Ontario has provided approval to proceed with a new Beaverton Thora Elementary School. The new school will be located at 270 King Street in Beaverton. The new building will include 418 student spaces, 49 childcare spaces, three childcare rooms, and one early on room. The dates of significance, as you can see, take us up to the end of October. That was an amazing report. Thank Kiana you for and Ryan from East Dill CVI for reading this month's good news. Thank you to our students from Eastdale. Thank you, Director Marsh, for sharing the good news. That's amazing. Um, now we will move into a number of recommended actions. And the first one, I'm going to go to Trustee Christine Thatcher. Move. The board now receive the minutes and approve the actions of the September 6, 2022 Standing Committee meeting. Could I have a motion to receive this report? Trustee Templeton, seconded by Trustee Edwards. All those in favor? Motion is carried. For the next item, I'm going to bring forth a recommended action, so I'm going to ask Vice Chair Thatcher to chair this part. Thank you. Uh, so this is um, item 13B, and I'll call on Chair uh, Morton to present information around the Amber Alert communication. Thank you. I would like to draw your attention to a very sad, tragic event which occurred in June. An 11-year-old, Draven Graham, from Brock Township, tragically went missing, and he lost his life. The circumstances of Draven's disappearance did not warrant an Amber Alert to be issued by the province of Ontario. I would like to suggest that we write a letter to the province asking that they broaden their scope of the Amber Alert system to include children and youth with special needs or develop a new community warning program similar to the Amber Alert. 
Hence, I would like to put forward the following motion that the Durham District School Board Trustees request the Province of Ontario to review the current Amber Alert program and criteria to include missing and at-risk vulnerable persons or establish a new program. That's my motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chair Morton. Um, we have a motion on the floor. I'm looking for a seconder. Thank you, Trustee Edwards. Uh, are there any questions or discussion around the motion? I'm seeing none. Uh, so I will ask then, uh, all in favor of this motion? Is there anyone who's opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Back to you, Chair Morton. Thank you, Vice Chair Thatcher. Moving on to trustee vacancies. There is a report that can be found on pages 57 to 60. At the present time, we have three trustee vacancies. I'm wondering if Director Marsh would like to speak to that report. Thank you, Chair Morton. I'm not sure if Council Cotter had planned to, so I'll turn it over to you first and then uh, happy for you to take the lead if you like. Sure, thank you, uh, Director Marsh, and through you, Chair Morton. Um, so as noted, the report can be found at page uh, 57 of the package. Uh, the report summarizes the relevant provisions of the Education Act and uh, the board's consolidated bylaws, in particular section um, 6.2.1. So under the, um, under the Education Act, if the vacancy occurs um, within 30 days of the next election, the board need not fill the vacancy. If it occurs uh, outside of that 30-day period, um, the vacancy is, is to be filled. However, um, there is 90 days to fill the vacancy. So there is some interpretation that needs to be applied to these provisions, but it needs to be done um, in our view. Um, by the uh, by, the vacancy committee. So it would be the vacancy committee that would consider the provisions of the Education Act and the options that are laid out in the consolidated bylaw, which could include uh, appointment from uh, one appointment of one of the unsuccessful candidates from that, the last municipal election. Um, so we are recommending that the board uh, strike a vacancy committee, which would consist of the elected members of the. Uh, uh, or certainly would be available for all elected members of the Board of Trustees, and that would be the vacancy committee that would then um, determine um, both the viability uh, of the options and which options the committee uh, may choose depending on uh, viability. So subject to any questions you may have, that's, uh, that is our report. Trustee Lundquist. Thank you, Chair Morton. I'm happy to move the motion that the DDSB establish a vacancy committee. I also have a question, but I can wait until it's, if that seconded or not. Then if you've put forward the motion, I'm going to ask for somebody to second that motion. Of course. And seconder, thank you, Trustee Bird. Before we take a vote on that, then we'll have your question, Trustee Lundquist. And I apologize because I think my question might be tangentially connected, but it's connected. <laughs> So in the interim, what is quorum? Because I'm puzzled by this because we had 11 and now we have eight. And I don't, I don't know what that means for the way we're conducting business. And I just want to be clear about what we're doing. So I'm hoping we can get some direction on that. Good question. Council Cotter. So, um, I think when we're talking, there's a few different ways to view quorum. I think when they're talking about quorum in the Education Act, uh, they have some thresholds about uh, the board not losing quorum. And as I read those sections, they're referencing, um, you know, the um, the original elected members of the board. So for the purposes of the Education Act, it, for example, you may not accept the you may not accept the board may determine not to accept the resignation under the Education Act if it would lose quorum. Um, in other words, to go below, in our case, six. 
um, quorum would be different um, in terms of how, how it's applied in our bylaws for the purposes of determining whether a meeting can move forward. Um, and, um, and I would interpret those provisions. We'd have to look at, I think, each one, but as a general matter, I would say that is a quorum of existing trustees. So under the currently constituted board, um, the quorum would be five. I don't have another, oh, I do. Um, so if quorum is five, I, and I'm sorry, because I feel like I'm being obtuse about this and I don't mean to be, but I wanna be sure that we, like if we have a, a vote, the majority is based on members present as opposed to active members of the board. I, I'm sorry, because that's not clear at all, but it's clear in my own head and I'm hoping you can sort through that for me in some way. I'm just, I, I don't understand. If we have eight active members of the board, what is a majority vote? That's all I'm trying to understand. So that's, that's um, through you, Chair Morton. That's a, uh, actually a separate question than quorum. So quorum determines really whether the, whether the meeting can, can proceed, whether you have a sufficient number of trustees present to allow the meeting to go forward. Determining, determining whether a resolution carries um, according to the bylaws is a majority of members present and voting. Um, so um, that's a different, it's a, it's a slightly different calculation. Trustee Edwards. Thank you. Uh, Council Carter somewhat answered my question, but it is to do with the overlap of the, the 90 days and the 30 days. In that, um, does that, you know, we have to uh, fill the vacancy if it's before the 30 days. However, we have 90 days. And I know you, you uh, mentioned that it was part of the committee. But that mean, does that mean we have four days to make that decision? Because basically the 24th is 30 days. Um, so we have to meet before that in order to make that decision. Or if we end up going over that, this, does the 30 days fall into play? So this is, I, and I have a subsequent question, I guess would be for the committee if then at that point in time, well, actually, no, there's still a subsequent question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Edwards, and through you, Chair Morton. So um, the 30-day um, uh, time period is relevant, uh, I would submit, uh, on a reading of the Education Act only in terms of when the vacancy occurs. So in other words, if the vacancy occurred on day 32 and the committee didn't meet till day 28, uh, you would still have an obligation to, um, to fill that spot. But... Um, you know, the provisions all have to be read together and you do have 90 days to, to actually, uh, comp you know, to complete the process. Um, so I think really, um, which is why we've recommended that you establish the committee, I think that that issue of the viability of the appointment um, within the time frame is an issue for the committee depending on which option uh, the committee would pursue and that would include an, an assessment of the viability. Um, so we're recommending that the committee be established and the committee determine um, viability uh, of the appointment um, within, the, within the time period and uh, based on the options that may be chosen um, and assessing the viability of that and it would be something that the committee would be within the committee's authority to do. Okay, that, I don't need to, my second question, thank you. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the motion as it reads on page 60, this report is provided to the Board of Trustees and recommends the establishment of a vacancy committee in accordance with section 6.2.1 of the consolidated bylaws. That motion was put forward by Trustee Lundquist. It has been seconded and I am now calling for the vote. Please indicate and you do have or if you could please use those to indicate if you support that motion. The, 
that motion has carried. Thank you. Trustee Lundquist, you could simply wave your hand or whatever we need to do. Moving on to the next item, the election of an audit committee member. But at the present time, we don't need one audit committee member. We are in need of two members. So we're going to open an election for audit committee members. I will now open the nominations. You may nominate yourself or you may nominate somebody else. Trustee Templeton. Uh, I'd like to self-nominate. Thank you, Trustee Templeton. Trustee Templeton has self-nominated. Do we have other nominations for the position of audit committee member? Other nominations? We need a second person to serve on the audit committee. Is there somebody who would self-nominate or nominate somebody else? Then I will self-nominate. Are there any further nominations? Are there any further nominations? Seeing none, I thank you, Trustee Templeton, for being willing to serve on the audit committee. Thank you. Moving on to E, the election of an alternate special education advisory committee. So this is the SEAC committee. We need an alternate trustee to serve on that committee. Again, I am asking for a self-nomination or a nomination of somebody else. Trustee Edwards. Just a point of clarification. It is actually for a member of SEAC um, because uh, Trustee Forbes was the member. So we're actually looking for a member, a second member of SEAC because there's two members, not an alternate. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. We're looking then for a member to serve on SEAC. Trustee Lowry. Thank you, Trustee Lowry. Are there other further nominations? Are there any further nominations? I will ask a third time, are there any further nominations? Seeing none, I will thank Trustee Lowry for serving on the SEAC committee. Thank you, Trustee Lowry. Moving on to F. 2022 Municipal Election Appointment of Members to the Compliance Audit Committee. This report is found on pages 61 to 68, and we are going to go to Executive Rob Serjanik. Thank you, Chair Morton. Uh, the Municipal Elections Act requires that school boards establish a compliance audit committee before October 1st of an election year. Uh, the purpose of the committee is to hear and decide on applications for a compliance audit made by electors who believe on reasonable grounds that a candidate in the election has contravened one or more provisions of the Municipal Elections Act in relation to election campaign finances. Uh, we've recruited potential members for the Compliance Audit Committee from Durham Region's Compliance Audit Committee, uh, similar to a process uh, the last election, slightly different but similar. Uh, all candidates have been confirmed to be qualified by the region and understand the Compliance Audit Committee process. To date, no candidates uh, who have run for the DDSP in the history that we're aware of have been required to undergo a compliance audit, but we are required to have one. Um, you can find the draft resolution uh, in Appendix A of the report for the committee and prospective committee members in Appendix B of the report for your consideration. Comments or questions for Mr. Serjanik?
I'm looking at page 64, and there is a recommendation there. This report is provided to the Board of Trustees for approval of the draft resolution as outlined in Appendix A and the appointment of members of the Compliance Audit Committee as outlined in Appendix B. Would somebody like to move that motion? Thank you, Trustee Lundquist. Seconded by Trustee Edwards. Further discussion? Seeing none, I would call that vote. So if it's easier to use your green and red, let's use those. Thank you, that motion has passed. Thank you. Moving on to short-term borrowing, we need a resolution. We are going to go to Associate Director Wright. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. On an annual basis, school boards are required to secure short-term borrowing facilities to support school board operations and in terms of managing cash flow. This borrowing is anticipated to largely deal with capital projects and land purchases, but may be required for operating cash flow from time to time as well. As highlighted in the report in your package this evening, we are suggesting a credit facility maximum of $175 million, which is anticipated to call, cover all needs over the course of this school year. The recourse to borrowing, of course, is that the board incurs interest. Interest incurred to cover expenditures related to capital projects are covered by the Ministry of Education. Interest incurred to cover EDC eligible expenses, i.e. land purchases, are charged to the EDC deficit. The bylaws included in your package is Appendix A, and I'm happy to answer any questions through you. Thank you. Are there questions or comments for Associate Director Wright? I am seeing no questions, so I'm looking at the recommendation on page 70. It is recommended that the Board of Trustees approve the borrowing resolution for the 2022-2023 school year. Would there be somebody willing to put forward that motion? Thank you, Trustee Edwards. Seconded by Trustee Thatcher. Comments or questions? Seeing none, I will call the vote. <laughs> Thank you kindly, that motion has passed. Moving on to the next report, honoraria for board members. Again, we will go back to Associate Director Wright. Thank you once again, Madam Chair. Ontario Regulation 357.06 outlines the timeline and process for determining trustee honoraria. In terms of timing, the outgoing Board of Trustees must establish the honoraria for the incoming Board, and this report is coming for decision this evening in advance of the October 24th election. In terms of process, there are a number of components that comprise trustee honoraria. Those are laid out in chart form on page 79 in Appendix B to this report. In addition to the base amount, which has been frozen since 2006 for trustees, the enrollment amount, uh, and the enrollment amount, excuse me, there is also the potential for trustees to receive an attendance amount. My understanding is that the Board of Trustees at DDSB has historically foregone the attendance amount, and the recommendation included in the report does reflect the continuation of that practice. However, happy to provide more information on that if any trustee would like. The recommendation is on page 73 of the package, and I'm happy to answer any questions for you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Questions for Associate Director Wright? I'm looking at page 73, and the recommendation reads like this. The following draft resolution is provided for the Board of Trustees' consideration that the honoraria for board members for the Durham District School Board for the term of office November 15th, 2022 to November 14th, 2026 be as follows. Base amount, 
The annual base amount per trustee for the period November 15, 2022 to November 14, 2026 shall be $5,900. The annual base amount for the chair and the vice chair in all years of the term shall be the amount set out above, plus an additional $2,500 for the vice chair and an additional $5,000 for the chair. The enrollment amount per trustee will be calculated annually and shall be 100% of the amount determined when multiplying the board's day school average daily enrollment ADE for the previous year's estimates by $1.75 and dividing by the number of trustees, plus an additional amount of two and a half cents times the ADE for the position of vice chair and five cents times ADE for the position of chair of the board. And that's in accordance with regulation 357-06. Would somebody like to move that motion? Thank you, Trustee Templeton, seconded by Trustee Bird. Comments or questions before we take the vote? Then I will call the vote. Please indicate either the green check mark or the red X. Thank you, that motion has passed. Moving on to draft learning resource selection policy and for this report, I'm going to go to Trustee Lundquist. Trustee Lundquist. Thank you, Chair Morton. The report that we're looking at first is found at page 80 of the materials. The learning resource selection policy, the draft revised policy went through the governance and policy committee and was approved to go to the board on June 13th, 2022. Policy did come to the board on June 20th, 2022 as a notice of motion and stakeholder consultation followed, which has informed the final draft version of the policy and the procedure being considered today. The policy was updated in order to better align with the recently approved human rights anti-discrimination and anti-racism policy and the Indigenous Education Policy. The updated policy provides guidance on the selection and review of teaching and learning resources in accordance with the district's commitment to promoting and upholding Indigenous rights and human rights in all of its learning and work environments. The policy will ensure that the appropriate stakeholders are consulted in the review and selection process. Example, new resources relating to Indigenous education must be approved by the DDSB's Indigenous Education staff and that process are in place for the reconsideration of challenged resources. I move that we adopt the revised policy. We have a motion on the floor. Would somebody second that motion, please? Thank you, Trustee Thatcher. Discussion, questioning. Trustee Edwards. Uh, just, just a question, it's not on the policy. It, it's more of, again, is, is are, are we going to be tracking um, uh, parents' concerns consolidated at a, a, a board level just in case there are resources that come up, say one in one school, two in another, and that then it becomes a, a board issue. I'm just wondering if, what tracking we're gonna be doing. Thank you, through you, Chair Morton. We will be because as part of the review process, a tr trustee is invited uh, to be part of that committee. And so we're happy then to compile on an annual basis uh, as we did this year for trustees information in relation to the themes and the number of uh, reviews that were conducted. Trustee Thatcher. Thank you. Um, I don't have any problems with the with the policy or the procedure here. I was just um, wondering, in terms of purchasing our resources, 
do we have a, is our policy a centralized or a decentralized policy? Um, in other words, um, or, or a combination of the two. Thank you. I'll turn it over uh, to Superintendent, Superintendent Davis to begin, and then we'll go from there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, it is a combination because the policy is a centralized policy. We do have um, our teacher facilitator, librarian facilitator who supports that, but also the selection of the resources is also school-based as well. So we do have centralized supports for our teacher librarians who are learning about the policy and selection to, to lead in the schools, but we also have our classroom teachers who have access to that to support as well. So it's both. So just um, supplemental. Um, do we do we provide um, a list of approved um, learning res resources and budgets? Uh, how do we go about doing that? Perhaps I'll begin and then uh, someone can add if they like. So uh, it used to be, for example, that there was, when I started teaching the um, Circular 13, I think it was called, and then there was the Trillium list. Uh, because of the abundance of resources and availability, it's impossible for any list to stay current in terms of using resources in schools. What we'll find most often is that the decision around uh, purchasing of resources, because it is done through the budget process, school budget process, uh, and so there are limitations in terms of being able to purchase new resources. So typically it's done through department or division collaborative decision making. Uh, that request then goes to the principal and the principal approves it as part of the school budget for that year. Okay, thank you. Trustee Lowry. Thank you, and through you, I just wanted some clarification under 3.5 where it says parents, guardians, et cetera, can uh, object to resources in accordance with the terms of the procedure. Is that the procedure outlined in subsection D, resolution guidelines? Am I, am I right in that? Thank you, and through you, Chair Morton. So, um, Trustee Lowry, when you look at the procedure, there is actual uh, a request for reconsideration in 2.3, and it works through both an informal and formal reconsideration process that unpacks the specific clause that you outlined in the policy. Thank you. Do you have a supplemental question, Trustee Lowry? No, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. We have a recommendation. The motion is on the table. It has been seconded that the Board of Trustees consider, and as it may deem appropriate, approves the draft learning resource selection policy. Please indicate if you are in favor of that policy, that motion. That motion passes, thank you. Moving on to the revised bylaw, receiving board correspondence letters. And again, we will go to Trustee Lundquist. Trustee Lundquist. Thank you, Chair Morton. The second matter arising out of the policy or governance and policy committee, sorry, is the revised bylaw on receiving board correspondence letters. The draft revised bylaw uh, is being presented for approval following discussions at the May 10th and June 13th, 2022 meetings of the Governance and Policy Committee. The revised bylaw came to the board on June 20th, 2022 as a notice of motion. The revisions to section 2.2.2 provide a standard process as to receipt of correspondence and dissemination of information to board members, specifically, as it relates to the chair's obligation with respect to correspondence received in the capacity as chair of the Board of Trustees. Um, and I'm just going to make an observation before the motion is moved that because it's a um, 
amendment to a bylaw, it requires two thirds. And I just want, I just want to <laughs> flag that because that's why I was asking about not quorum earlier, but majority because I was unclear on that. Um, so having said all of that, I would like to move the motion that we adopt the revised bylaw on receiving board correspondence. Thank you. Could I ask you to repeat on page 105, 2.2.2, .2 .2, the new H section that we are addressing? I would be happy to do that, Chair Morton. 2.2.2H reads as follows. Share with the Board of Trustees any correspondence delivered to the Chair in that capacity that addresses the business of the Board of Trustees. Subject to any issue of urgency, such correspondence shall be shared at the next meeting of the Board of Trustees. However, the chair shall not share any correspondence that contains personal attacks against any individual trustee or staff member. In any such case, the chair shall consider the code of conduct in determining how best to respond to the correspondence, if at all. Thank you, Trustee Lundquist, for that clarification. We have a motion on the floor. I would call for a seconder for that motion. Thank you, Trustee Templeton. Questions or comments? Trustee Edwards. I would like to amend the, the motion for, of, of the statement just to strike if at all, and that I think that no matter what the correspondent is, we should at least acknowledge the, that we've received it. So a receipt of, of a correspondence, um, so I, I just have a problem with the words, if at all. Trustee Lundquist. If that's the will of the board, then, then, then that's the will of the board. So I certainly, if not my motion, once it's been seconded, it's, it hasn't it's, been seconded you know, yet, so. Oh, it wasn't, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well then, I put the motion, yeah. then sure thing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually agree. It's a better practice to respond respectfully even if the email isn't respectful. So I have no issue with it and I would adopt it as a friendly amendment. So it would read exactly the same with the words, if at all, stricken. So we're in agreement that that would be removed? I, I'm comfortable with that. Thank you. So you've put the motion on the table? Thank you. Seconded? No, I put the motion on it ahead. I said I would like to move the, the motion, motion to strike out the words, and Chessie Linkwood seconded it. <laughs> Sorry, I, that was my fault. I put an original motion on. She asked for an, um, Trustee Edwards asked for amendment. So it was my original motion. It's now mm -hmm. Trustee Edwards motion. And I have seconded that motion. I agree that that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm, so just, we, I'm sorry for the confusion. But it's all on the table and it's been seconded and I'm going to turn my microphone off now. So you have to, you have to, because I actually made a motion I'm sorry, to strike. Could... Because I actually put a motion to strike the words, you have to do a, a vote on the amendment first and then the vote on the original motion. Thank you. We will vote on the amendment then. Thank you. The amendment has passed. We will go back to the original motion. Chair, as just for the purpose of the minutes, I think um, we've gotten a bit complicated. I think it was a friendly amendment and the original motion had not been seconded. So the friendly amendment was adopted by the motioner. So I think we just need someone to second the, friend, the um, revised motion. Uh, because it, it's still Trustee Lundquist's motion. She accepted a friendly amendment, and then it's one vote on that motion. Thank you for that clarification. The motion is on the table by Trustee Lundquist, seconded by Trustee Templeton. Thank you. Before we vote, we will call for questions or comments. I have a question. And my question is regarding to the chair's responsibilities, because when 
the chair is in that position. The chair also is part of the many different committees. And I'm thinking of the DSTS Governance Committee. I'm thinking of Equity and Diversity. I'm thinking of Ignite Learning. So any of the letters or emails that come to the chair in the capacity of those committees, would the chair be responsible for forwarding all of those emails? And I'm thinking all the busing issues at the present time. So if somebody could offer clarification for that, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Um, Trustee Lundquist, I'm happy to, to jump in on this if that's okay. Uh, through you, Chair, Chair Morton. Um, the amendment to the bylaw is limited to correspondence delivered to the chair in that capacity that addresses the business of the Board of Trustees. So it would not, would not relate to uh, committee issues or uh, as you've, other issues that you've raised in, the, in your hypothetical. Thank you for that clarification. Did you want to address that, Trustee Lundquist? Okay. We have a motion on the table. It has been seconded. And I'd like to call the vote at the present time. And that vote has passed unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to information items. And the first one is quarterly construction and major projects progress report. And we will call on Associate Director Wright. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And through you, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Lisa Bianca, Head of Facility Services, who is joining us this evening and will present the report. Thank you, Associate Director Wright, and through you, Chair Morton. Uh, thank you. I'm here this evening to present the uh, quarterly construction and major projects report. This report provides an update on the status of construction and major projects as of August 31st, 2022. Further updates will be provided in January, March, and June um, of the coming year. Uh, the board has approved, uh, the board has received approval for five new school builds, uh, one major addition, and uh, the stage of development of each of these projects is included in the report and uh, ranges uh, from engaging an architect uh, to proceeding to tender and uh, on to construction for, uh, for two of our projects, which would be the Beaverton Thora rebuild and the unnamed North Oshawa Public School. Uh, six child care projects are also in development with staff uh, working to obtain the necessary approvals uh, for these to move uh, forward. Uh, Major Projects continues to undertake and deliver a significant number of projects both over the summer and throughout the uh, school year where possible and where it's safe to do so. Uh, the construction market does remain quite volatile. Uh, material price increases and labour shortages have been driving prices up in many sectors. Uh, staff are very keen to ensure that the board's receiving the best value uh, for the funding available and are being very strategic in the timing and the scope of projects that we are uh, proceeding with. Uh, this concludes my report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you, and thank you for joining us in person this evening. It is good to see you. And we will go to Trustee Templeton. I had one question. Um, I haven't been able to go back over to Bellwood and take a look, but there were some sinkholes that were by the sign in the parking lot. I was just wondering if they fall under the construction or is that updated construction? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Trustee Templeton and, uh, and through you, Chair. Um, they do fall under the maintenance uh, portfolio for us, and we have, uh, we have referred those uh, to our maintenance team. Um, sometimes when we are uh, putting these new signs in, uh, we, uh, they backfill as best they can, but uh, if you get a little bit of rain, it, uh, it does create those situations. So our maintenance team are definitely uh, aware and will uh, we'll make the repairs. Uh, just supplementary, um, do we have a timeline at all on that repair? Because th when I was by there, the holes are pretty big and it is dangerous. Or has it been guarded, uh, taken off so people can't get into it? Uh, 
thank you. I don't have a, a, an update as of, uh, as of this week, but I will certainly follow up and make sure that it is a priority uh, for the team. We certainly want to make it safe for the school community. So thank you. Thank you. As you, as you mentioned uh, that there has been a significant cost to materials and construction costs and, and so forth, I just wanted to uh, ask is, is that the significant costs, um, we do get approval as far as the cost of projects. Have pro any projects been delayed because of the increases so much that we've had to go back and request additional funds? Thank you, uh, and through you, Chair. Uh, some of our capital projects, we have had to go back to the ministry. Um, our funding, for instance, the Beaverton project is uh, is quite dated, so we do have to go back um, to, to seek additional funding uh, for those. Uh, within the major projects portfolio, because we are funded in a, in a larger pot, as it were, uh, we are able to make the adjustments within the funding that we have, and we will either uh, prioritize and phase a project, scale back, stretch it out. There, there are several tools that we can use, um, and we also plan for that. We have contingencies built in, so even when we do uh, you know, tender a little over, within reason, uh, we have already built in the ability to proceed. Um, so we have a couple of uh, different strategies that we can use depending if it's new construction or whether it's, uh, it's in the major projects uh, scheme. Are there further comments or questions? I have a question. And it, this concerns the unnamed North Oshawa Secondary School. Project completion is currently scheduled for September 2026 with the possibility of an earlier completion date once approvals are received. Four years seems like a long time to wait for a new school, especially when the need is so great. Could you comment further on that, please? Certainly, Chair Morton. Um, yes, four years does seem like a long time. Um, uh, however, there are so many uh, steps and, uh, and approvals uh, through the process. Um, construction period alone for a secondary school is approximately 24 months uh, because a secondary school is, is roughly three times. Uh, it's like building three elementary schools. So um, the lengthy uh, time frame, um, and as well, I mean, we have built in sort of standard uh, approval times for both uh, municipal, municipal approvals as well as ministry approvals to go ahead. Um, staff are working diligently to um, you know, act on uh, the approvals as quickly as they can. Uh, we've recently received approval from the ministry to proceed to hire an architect and, uh, and we expect to have that uh, accomplished within the next week or so and then uh, we will work with that design team team to, uh, to move that design and that project through the process as quickly and swiftly as possible. Thank you, and I hope that you could keep us posted on the progress of that. Thank you. Further comments or questions? Seeing none. We will move on to the draft accommodation plan, and we will go to Associate Director Wright. Thank you, Madam Chair, and again through you, Lisa is going to be taking us through uh, this report along with Carrie Trombino, Manager of Planning. Thank you, Associate Director Wright, and through you, Chair Morton. Um, I'm pleased to be here this evening to, uh, to share our accommodation plan for 2022 to 2026. Um, this annual report uh, identifies changes in demographics, uh, enrollment trends, school utilization, and growth analysis across the district. Um, for the past 30 months, uh, the pandemic has introduced many challenges, uh, not the least of which uh, has included fluctuations in enrollment, uh, changing growth patterns, uh, altering established areas of growth and decline. Uh, we've seen all of this, and for the first time in many years, we're seeing growth in uh, established mature neighborhoods that we haven't seen growth in for some time, um, in addition to, uh, to significant new development taking uh, place across the district, uh, particularly in the, uh, the northern parts of the uh, uh, municipalities. Um, these factors and their impact uh, 
are reflected in this report, and staff will continue to analyze the data uh, for new and emerging trends um, that we will utilize as we uh, look to the future. Um, enrollment projections have been provided for report years 2022 to 2026. These projections are updated each spring with data uh, derived. And just to give you an idea, they come from a variety of sources. So kindergarten pre-registrations, uh, grade to grade progression of students, and also yield from new developments. We will continue to monitor those into the coming year. Um, the decline that we saw in junior kindergarten students uh, in 20 and 21 uh, appears to to have rebounded significantly. Um, and many families who chose DDSB at home um, as their learning choice have returned to, uh, to in-person uh, in -person learning. Um, as we just discussed, capital priorities allocations remain strong with our uh, two new projects being announced this year. Um, and as well, existing projects are uh, working through, uh, through the uh, process. Um, while we do wait for um, these projects to come to fruition, uh, we are uh, employing uh, portables as temporary accommodation uh, measures, and we continue to add new units uh, in this period um, while we wait for our new builds to be completed. Um, staff, you'll notice in the report, staff have identified both high and uh, low utilization schools. Uh, many high utilization schools are holding schools for growth areas, and we will see relief from this when the schools are, uh, are opened. Um, we have uh, identified Clara Hughes as a candidate for a boundary review in this report, um, but that will be a decision that will we'll come, uh, come to the board. Um, uh, it was uh, one of the only sites where we have significant growth that's not being driven by, uh, by uh, you know, a holding situation. Um, so in conclusion, um, this plan will provide information on enrollment, school utilization, long-term trends and options uh, that will enable us to, uh, to accommodate uh, change across the district. And I'm happy to take your, uh, take your questions. Thank you, Carrie and Lisa, for being here, providing the report, and answering our questions. Trustee Thatcher. Thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, Lisa, I thought it was, uh, just to start with a comment, I thought it was really interesting, uh, the change of demographics that, at least I'll, I'll speak to Whitby because I'm familiar with it, that um, uh, many um, empty nesters I'm not sure if uh, the pandemic had anything to do with it, but have sold up here and moved out. And of course, young families have moved into the dwellings. So uh, we're seeing that that's, uh, I believe, what you refer to, see the change in, um, in some of those neighborhoods. Uh, I, I want to go back to the Ormiston situation, and I just want to, to mention <clears throat> that um, uh, if, if I could, through you, Chair, uh, when the safety um, uh, inspection or uh, evaluation is being done, uh, I, I, uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention, because there's another school in Whitby that we've been working very closely with uh, Lisa and Carrie with, and uh, one of our uh, counselors as well, that has, is, was built around the same time as Ormiston. And so we have some of the same problems there that have been reported to trustees. There is a, I think when those schools were built, I heard anyway, there was a, supposed to be a lot of encouragement for children walking. So the, there doesn't seem to be in a lot of parking spaces available. So one of my questions is, what do we do with the overflow parking? I mean, if we increase the, these classrooms, we increase teachers and possibly other support people, um, and they have vehicles. How do we deal with that? Um, the, uh, the flow of traffic in those buildings, at Ormiston and, and the other one in Whitby, is, has really created a safety concern 
uh, with um, buses coming in and uh, and parents coming in for the uh, before and after school programs, and um, it just is is a real concern. I do I do want to mention. I'll finish with a plus, though, that when we've got more staff, we've got more supervision. So that's a positive thing. But I'm just wondering when we are dealing with. Um, analysis of uh, some of the safety concerns, if we can take a look at um, the um, issues around the traffic flow uh, in front of that building. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Thatcher, and through you, Chair Morton. Um, yes, uh, Ormiston, uh, we were fortunate at Ormiston uh, to, uh, to plan some additional parking uh, over the last two years. Uh, with the pandemic, it did take us a little while to, uh, to get that project off the, uh, off the ground, but uh, that school is in a, uh, a more fortunate position than the other school that you were referring to because we have been able to uh, you know, add additional parking uh, to the site. Um, as part of our permit process when we do add uh, portables to a site. Part of the municipality's review is to make sure that we do have adequate parking. And so parking available as well as washroom capacity are the two measures that would um, either allow us to get a permit to add a portable or uh, prevent us from getting a, a, a permit for that portable. Um, the, the uh, traffic congestion that you refer to um, is a very real thing, um, especially for our um, sort of older schools that are sort of mid-block and uh, maybe smaller frontages, because that's what, you know, what uh, we built 40 years ago, um, primarily walking schools. So we work with our traffic team and the school team as well uh, to try and strategize, um, you know, how can we best uh, move the traffic in and out? How can we move the uh, the buses through um, you know efficiently and keep it safe for students so we will continue to uh, to work with Ormiston as they've you know had this uh, increase in population and uh, and do everything we can to put um, routines in place that will will keep uh, keep everyone safe during those high utilization times in the morning and at the end of the school day okay trustee Lundquist Thank you, Chair Morton. So I've spent some time looking at these numbers because they're concerning from a Whitby perspective, obviously. And we've heard a lot from Ormiston parents this week, but we've also heard from parents at Broughton, Fairman, um, Broughton, Fairman, I'm having a, a moment and it's not coming to me, Farewell, um, Westland, all holding schools for West Whitby. Pardon? I haven't heard from Glendu actually, but I believe you because it's reflective of a pretty significant problem. And so I appreciate that your report acknowledges that it can be alleviated by building, um, getting capital priority funding for, for this, but the challenge is it can't wait. And I think we actually need to send a letter in expressing the urgency of the concern because parents are, are reasonably upset. If my child is standing in a bathroom unable to use one and doesn't make it, I'm going to be upset. And I don't blame them for being upset. I don't blame the board that parents are upset either. I understand the problem. But if you're telling me it's gonna take four years from the time of approval to build something, we can't wait. We have to send something in, in my view. So I would ask the board to consider sending in another letter to the ministry expressing the urgency of the West Whitby situation. And then I also have a question related to that. So I would like to move that. So maybe I should ask my question first before I do so. And my question is, when these builds are approved, and I don't mean school builds, I mean these subdivisions are approved and there's no school yet, are builders required to advise potential people moving into those areas that there is no school yet on the books? And I'm asking that because we get a lot of email from upset parents who 
are being told essentially that a school will be built right there or over there, but there's no sort of indication of the time lag and there's little we can do about that, particularly without funding, and it's a frustrating thing, and I think that should be expressed in a letter as well, because they, they are connected fundamentally, and the school board takes a lot of flack for the things it doesn't have control over. So I'm hoping that my colleagues will agree that this is a high priority issue when you look at the numbers, and I'm not saying that there aren't going to be issues in Ajax and in Pickering where this is, you know, Seton, but they have some new schools coming at least up that way. We are in a dire position in Whitby, and it's expressed in the dozens and dozens of emails that we're getting that I think are fair and reasonable in the circumstances. Are you putting forth a motion then regarding a letter? I, I am. I would like to move that the DDSB Board of Trustees draft urgent correspondence to the minister expressing the seriousness of the pupil shortage, the spaces for pupil. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Carolyn, because tonight's not my night for words for some reason. But that, <laughs> that we put in a letter to the Ministry of Education expressing the need for capital funding on an urgent basis for a, a West Whitby school, an elementary school in particular. Thank you. much discussion before we vote on that motion trustee thatcher maybe out of order thank you um i was just going to comment on that um i mean i definitely think that uh as director marsh mentioned earlier uh, we were all well aware of the issue. We've been aware of it for several years and have uh, been coming up with uh, possible resolutions. But the bottom line is really that we need some new schools. And if we have to wait five or seven years, which is uh, uh, something that came up when we did the Donald A. Wilson review, well, I don't believe that that's going to be anything that it will be acceptable at all to our families. So I think it's important also to mention in this letter uh, that we really, as the Thames Valley letter in our, at the back of our package here has said, um, this issue, we need to consider the uh, length of time between when the funding is approved and when we build the school, because I think that is a real problem for us. That, re that time needs to be much shorter. So I'm just suggesting that we add that as part of our letter. I would like to suggest that when this letter is being written, that the Whitby trustees would be consulted and they would provide input. Trustee Edwards? My actually, my point was actually further on the report, but I, I will make one comment is that I've um, uh, been very familiar, uh, Trustee Lundquist uh, had mentioned about the difference between uh, the site approval and the proposed and the developers. Um, having worked with a uh, serving a mapping company, putting with the developers, putting out uh, uh, site plans and, and subdivision uh, plans, as well as working at a municipality who was responsible for the IT side of approving <laughs> site plans and subdivision plans. There is no, the way it works is there is no uh, required, as site plan can sit there for many, many years and has, I know in the case of Ajax and where the school board before I became a trustee actually did not, um, uh, when it came to a site plan, did not approve the, the like accept, purchase, uh, take the option of purchasing the land that was proposed for the school. And it all comes down to timing. There's no 
um, it, the timing between the school and the subdivision plus the requirement by the Minister of Education to actually uh, only accept enrollments based on uh, uh, enrollments based on uh, uh, approved subdivisions and the delays on that, it's a huge issue. So I agree with the whole uh, the whole formula and looking at approving of, of funding and, and then also then getting the funding once uh, a school has been approved, the whole issue has to be looked at. Thank you, Trustee Edwards. We have a motion put forward by Trustee Lundquist. It has been seconded regarding writing a letter for consideration of capital funding for Whitby schools. Please indicate your support for that motion or your non-support. And that receives unanimous support as well. Thank you. I think student trustee Ben, did you have a question? Ben Cameron, please. Uh, thank you, and through you, Madam Chair. I'm curious how the gifted program puts pressure on the system um, in relation to the number of st students it serves. Because um, I can see in the report that there's 251 students in secondary schools and 554 in elementary schools, which is around 1%. Um, and we've heard lots of concerns from trustees tonight. And I'm wondering what the board's perspective on gifted program and in, in its effects on our ability to serve the students who are not in the 1%. Lisa. Okay. Thank you for your question, Ben, and through you, Chair Morton. Actually, I'll defer to Carrie Trombino, who's online with us, because she can speak to the, uh, the uh, how we uh, accommodate the, uh, the gifted program, program in our facilities, and she'd be able to give us a better idea of how that impacts our ability to accommodate all students. So, Carrie, I'll defer to you on, uh, on this. Sorry, I'm just going to interrupt because I do know that Superintendent McCauley did have her hand up first, if that's okay. Uh, so perhaps we'll have her lead this response and then go from there. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. So just a contextual foundation before we go to uh, Carrie. So currently the gifted program in elementary is hosted at six of our elementary schools and in secondary hosted at four of the secondaries. Um, the percentages reflect the students who are reviewed into a self-contained special education class. So in elementary travel with up to 25 of their peers as a class cohort and in secondary are accessing um, courses, uh, again, as a class community. Um, we do monitor it. The reason why it's within this program, uh, within the enrollment and accommodations uh, report, is that within board procedure, um, it is noted as a full region program similar to French immersion. So if there's any consideration for school changes, um, it is within um, the process of a boundary review, um, which is sits a bit different than our other special education classes that we make annual adjustments. Um, so the percentages and numbers of students that you see accessing refer only to those who are in self-contained programs um, and do not reflect those who remain mainstream at their home schools. Uh, which sit uh, adjacent to this. Um, there is, uh, with our partners both in transportation and facilities, considerations for not only the buildings that the students are accessing, um, but how we physically move the students to those spaces. Um, drawing on a conversation earlier this evening, there is a fairly significant uh, weight on our transportation partners as well. Um, but really honoring that pathway of all students and that community that's formed um, and the gifted program being a commitment in Durham to our students currently. Um, but it's specific to your questions around um, the, in, the accommodations report, um, I would turn it to Carrie for further comment um, to augment for your question. Thank you, Superintendent McCauley. Will we now go to Carrie? Carrie Trombino. 
Hi. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Morton. Um, just to add, um, uh, Superintendent McCauley has been has given um, quite a bit of detail and, and her response. The only thing that I would say as far as the gifted program um, at the schools that they're located, they have been there for some time. Um, we don't we haven't made a lot of changes um, to our um, location of our gifted program. Um, I think a number of years ago, the last one would have been the gifted program at Donald A. Wilson um, at the elementary level. Le um, it would have been, I'm oh, sorry, it's at Anderson and that would have been the last um, move um, for elementary. It would have been most likely, I would think closer to 10 years ago when we split uh, the program in Whitby between Pringle Creek and Jack Minor, but um, they're um, quite established at the schools that they're at. Thank you, Carrie. Trustee Edwards, question? Um, yes, I have two questions um, in, again, looking at the report. One is around uh, portables and that, again, the, the, the table data. First of all, I, I want to say that you, I know that the planning staff do a phenomenal job on trying to balance all the regulations and requirements plus things that happen within the community as much as they can. And as I said, there are many times where site plans do sit there, we're not allowed to count them, but do sit there for over 10 years. And then all of a sudden they burst onto the seams and, and it's hard to accommodate with the current regulations and requirements by the Minister of Education. So, uh, but um, the, uh, the portables, and it, it does say that we all portables that we purchase now are air conditioned, and we note that we have air conditioned, but the number of air conditioned portables stays the same for the for six years at 235 when that number should increase under a twist. My, my thought process if we're buying air conditioned per portables. Thank you for your question, Trustee Edwards. Um, the, uh, the portables, yes, you're correct. All the portables we purchase going forward um, are air conditioned. The reason the number in the chart is static is that the uh, quantity of portables that we purchase um, is determined in year based on um, the pace that, uh, that development takes place. Uh, for instance, um, every time we open up a new school, uh, we usually gain 12 to 15 portables back into the system. So on those years, um, if that is the need in year based on the spring projections, um, we will reallocate and, and move forward. Um, every time a, uh, a capital build is delayed a year, uh, we don't get those portables back. In fact, we need more, and that's when we have to do an in-year purchase. And that in-year purchase, um, you know, maybe uh, you know, it may be ten. Um, it may push up upwards, you know, to twenty, depending on uh, what we're seeing in enrollment trends. So um, the chart is static going forward, but it does get updated sort of on an, on an in-year basis. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, it's it's again it's com comment around um, process and 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 as you mentioned in the in the report as it's mentioned in the report that uh, north of the municipality parts are growing and basically as you get towards the lake the southern parts the enrollment is usually declining and. Um, Again, it's how we do uh, adjust um, enrollments and, and the location of programs uh, within our schools. Uh, an example is that, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that Lakeside Public School has moved from red to yellow because it's increased from 69 to 85 percent. But Duffin Bay remains to be around 52, 53 percent for the next five or so years. And Bolton C. Falby is underutilized. Southwood is, has an unbalanced French immersion versus English program. It's like a 30-70 split, or 70-30 if you look French immersion to English. Uh, Cataraque um, has a little bit better split, split when it comes to programming. It's a, lot, a little bit easier to, to deal with. Um, and then Crothers Creek, where I always get lots of calls, especially this time of year as school starts, um, wondering why they can see the school, but they are bused to 
basically Bolton C. Falby. Um, and they are wondering why from that, and that's a typical case where there was a school up possibility of purchasing a lot many years before I became a trustee and it was it is now the Crothers Creek uh, Pavilion that is down there we did not purchase it take the option to purchase it from the developer so um, my biggest thing is is what and, and the ministry doesn't allow it has a moratorium on accommodation reviews and my concern is, again, is the ensuring that we have efficiency, effective uh, programming for both French immersion and English. What other options are we going to be able to do to look at the French immersion and, and the low enrollments and the high enrollments within Ajax in order to distribute that population and eliminate some of those high enrollments um, and, and further distribute it better throughout our Ajax? Thank you, Trustee Edwards. Um, I'll start off, and then I will uh, defer to uh, to Carrie for her for her detailed knowledge of uh, of, uh, of the Ajax sort of enrollment and distribution. I will start off by saying, uh, with regard to the French immersion enrollment, um, one of the curious trends um, that we saw over the pandemic and that's reflected in the report is you'll see there's been a drop in uh, uptake for uh, French immersion um, programs, and it's. Uh, it's something that we hadn't seen. We'd been on a steady incline for many years. Um, and we need to determine whether it's just a blip um, you know, as a result of the pandemic and things will resume again and we can plan for that or whether it's a shift. Um, it takes a few years to sort of establish a trend and we're, we're concerned that if we, we um, adjust too quickly, we might be creating further issue uh, down, down the road. So I'll turn it over to Carrie because she'll be able to, uh, to address, uh, you know, the uh, way we could, um, we can manage um, enrollment, uh, you know, highs and lows across the, uh, the Ajax schools. Thank you, Lisa. Um, just to add to that, um, we would need to look at all of the schools as uh, Trustee Edwards had indicated in South, in South Ajax, it would be a large review to review all the boundaries. Um, one of the key points is the French immersion and just how to project that forward. Um, that's why we um, look for another year or two to see what trends are there so that as Lisa had indicated, um, making changes and then having to go back out to the community again. Um, one one um, piece of additional information um, for the area, the school site that wasn't taken um, in the development, uh, we do have a site designated just north of that um, in, in the area, but that those lands haven't been developed and have eventually they will, <laughs> but um, they've, um, been owned by various uh, different uh, developers and um, haven't progressed at this point. But um, the French immersion piece, along with the ministry and um, with the mor moratorium on closures, and if you know that was something we'd need to look at, um, it would be good, good to have those two pieces um, in our hands um, moving forward to do a review. So um, we're hoping in another year or so, if we have more information that, that we can move forward with a review for um, the entire area in Ajax. In the meantime, similar to other areas, um, we would accom we can accommodate with uh, portables um, and um, portables, overflow uh, students if need be, but I believe that, but there's, the schools in Ajax and any of the schools were mentioned, they can accommodate portables. They're, they're not in the same situation, for example, that we discussed at some of the schools in West Whitby. We're not at that point. There's not that growth, um, large growth area down there. So I, I think we're in better shape um, over the next year or two. Thank you, Carrie. Are there other questions? I do have a couple. I'm looking at the Brock Elementary capacity, which is presently 1,200. This is on page 189. 
Capacity is 1,200, but the enrollment is nearly 1,400. Is that overcapacity just in Beaverton, or is that happening in Sunderland, and is it happening in Cannington as well? Thank you, Chair Morton. Um, it would be across the uh, entire township of Brock, so it would include uh, McCaskill's, uh, Cannington, uh, McCaskill's in Cannington, uh, Sunderland, Beaverton. Um, it would include that entire group of schools. Um, 200 uh, uh, students over uh, the capacity is approximately eight portables. And as you know, across those schools, we, uh, we do have that many. Um, so it is across all of the schools in Brock. Thank you. I have a second question. On page 190, Brock High School has an enrollment of approximately 400 but the capacity is well over 600. And you state that you are considering examining partnership opportunities. What opportunities are we seeking there? Thank you. Um, in the last few years, as you know, we did uh, construct a youth hub uh, at the school to be able to bring community partners uh, into the building. Um, it was uh, a reutilization of, uh, of two classrooms, or three classrooms on the, uh, on, the lower, uh, on, on the lower level of the school, and that enables us to bring uh, partners in. Um, if we do see a long-term um, uh, sort of uh, um, vacancy in a building. Um, we do uh, look at other opportunities. For instance, many of our elementary schools receive childcare projects over the last, um, you know, six or six or eight years to utilize or to to reuse underutilized space. Um, I'm not suggesting for men, you know, that we're looking at a childcare for Brock, but but there certainly are, um, you know partnership opportunities if we do have um, ongoing uh, space available to the buildings. And we do find that when you bring community partners in like childcare and, uh, and other, um, sometimes it's, it's a community partner that just utilizes our classroom on a temporary basis for a year or two years. Um, it certainly does add to uh, uh, the robustness of the school community and it serves that community well, um, particularly our rural, our rural sites. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Carrie, for joining us for providing this amazing report, a very lengthy report, but thank you kindly for doing that. Moving on, we will ask for the SEAC report, and that would be Trustee Edwards. Thank you. The SEAC meeting Meeting minutes from June 16th can be found on pages 230 to 239. I would just like to add that we did have our SEAC meeting last Thursday, and one of our uh, members at large, Carolyn McClellan, has stepped down. Um, so we will be looking at, there is an advertising process and a process to, um, to get applications uh, for a member at large. So we will be looking for a member at large, and that's my report. Thank you, Trustee Edwards. Comments or questions for Trustee Edwards? Seeing none, Governance and Policy Committee, we will go to Trustee Lundquist. Trustee Lundquist. Thank you, Chair Morton. There are minutes from the last Governance uh, and Policy Committee meeting that are found at 240 to 242 of the board's agenda package. And I would just ask the board receive those minutes. Comments or questions regarding the Governance and Policy Committee? Seeing none. Thank you. And the OPSPA report, we will go to Vice Chair Thatcher. Uh, thank you, there is no OPSPA report tonight. Thank you. I draw your attention to three letters contained in the correspondence section. And if there is no other business, let us consider this meeting to be adjourned. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>